Hello everybody, my name is Mike Drodis. Thanks for joining me today. We are starting a study in the end times, also called eschatology. I've been studying the end times for the last 20 to 25 years. And for most of that time, it was, it was very complicated and hard to figure out. It was like I was trying to put together a puzzle. This one is over a thousand pieces. Uh, I was trying to put together a puzzle, but I didn't know what the picture looked like. And so I had a, all these little pieces that I would try to fit together. And for years, things just weren't fitting together. Finally, in the last few years, um, things have begun to come together in, an, in a greater fashion. And I'm not the only one who's seen this, but the puzzle pieces are beginning to uh, work out. So with this study, I, be, I, wanted, to, I wanted to see um, where we would begin. I thought maybe we'd start in Revelation, and then I thought maybe in, in, um, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, possibly 1 Thessalonians. But when I really began to give it some thought, I thought the best place to start an end time study would be before time even began. You know, time was invented for us, for mankind. Where God is, it's in eternity, there is no time. There's an eternity past, and there's an eternity future. But right now, we're living in a thin sliver of, of, of a period that we call time here. But in 2 uh, Timothy, I'd like to share with you something real quickly. 2 Timothy 1.9. The Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So you see, time has a beginning. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. We were chosen by God before the foundation of the world, before the world was even created. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So we see there that time has a beginning time has an end. We see, we see that in everyday circumstances. Each day has a beginning and it has an end. Each week has a beginning and an end. Each year has a beginning and an end. Even our lives have a beginning and an end. And even if we live on this earth for 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 20 years, it's just a small speck of sand on a colossal beach when you think about eternity. But what we do here on this earth at the, the, with the time that we are given will have eternal consequences. For it's only here and only now while we are still alive that we have the opportunity to, to reach toward God and to come into a relationship with Him or try to do things on our own. But what we do on this earth will lead to eternal uh, consequences later on. So every day is important. Every moment is important. And, and all that we do, we must have this thought in our mind that one day we will stand before God. So I want to talk to you today from Genesis chapter 1. We'll go back to the beginning of time. Actually, back before time. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. I like these verses. Verse 1, it simply says God created. Not a cosmic accident, not a big bang, not a mistake, but God created the world and the universe. Then in verse 3, he draws his attention toward this earth, towards this place where we live. 
And in verse 4, God's, and God saw the light. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And that is the beginning of time. The very first day of creation, God created time. Time for man. Time, time on, for this earth. There is a beginning and there is an end. And we are in the latter days of, of, the, end, of, of the earth. Verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. First day. I like how the Bible says evening and morning. In, with the Hebrews, the day begins at sunset. So the very first day occurred when God created light and darkness and separated them. Anyway, let's look at eternity past, before this creation, before God created the time. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 through 31, we read about how God, before the earth was even made, was, was there with wisdom before the foundation of, of this earth. So there's an eternity past. In Job chapter 38, we read that, that angels were actually in eternity past. Job 38, verse 2, Who is this who, who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. God's questioning Job, um, and, and he's asking Job these questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the, the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Look at verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Sons of God in this verse is referring to angels. It, it, man wasn't even here until after God created the earth. So the sons of God in this verse was talking about the angels who would, who would worship and sing to God. These created beings are are not men. You do not die and become an angel. These angels were created before mankind, and they, they are distinct and separate from mankind. And they were there in eternity past. Now, let's look in the word about um, a prophetic rule that we need to, need to understand. It's called the rule of double reference. Now, double reference, you could get really deep into this, or you, we could just stay on the surface. Right now, we'll just stay on the surface. A rule of double reference, whenever there is a prophecy in the Old Testament, say a prophet of God was seeing something, and, and he was prophesying, and it was happening in his time frame, but also with the rule of double reference means that it, there's a reference to the future, usually the end times or, you, or the millennial kingdom. And uh, we see this often in the Bible. Uh, one example would be when, when uh, Moses was told by God to build a tabernacle. Now, this tabernacle that Moses was, was to build, God showed him the true tabernacle in heaven. And so this tabernacle that Moses built on the earth was a replica of it. There are, there are many, many, many things that um, happen in heaven and then is duplicated here on earth. Another thing is the mountain of God that we read about in, in Scripture. Um, Micah chapter 4. Please turn to Micah chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, so Micah is looking towards the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain, and there shall be, and shall be exalted above hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So in the latter days, in the millennial reign, there will be a mountain of God where all the nations will come to worship before the Lord. 
Verse 7, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. So that's in the latter days, in the future, during the millennial kingdom. Now look at Joel. A few pages back, Joel chapter 3. Verse 17, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no aliens shall ever pass through her again. So right here in Joel, Joel sees that God is living in the holy mountain. God is living in the holy mountain, but they also see that in the millennial kingdom there will be a holy mountain in Jerusalem. It's a rule of, it's a double reference. Psalm 48. Let everything be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So I usually try to do two or three verses to establish something. So Psalm 48. Verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. So once again, we have God living in the, in, in the north, in, in, in the holy mountain, the Mount Zion. Revelation 21.10 is another verse that you can look at. So in eternity past, there was a holy mountain, and it was there, and it's still there now, where God lives. And, and there is a temple at this holy mountain. And the sons of God, the angels, would sing and worship unto God. But in the temple on this holy mountain, there was no high priest. But there was a leader. There was someone anointed by God. And his name was Lucifer, the anointed cherub, who would lead the sons of God to the temple where they would praise and worship God. We read about Lucifer, who was a created being, in Ezekiel. Chapter 28. Now, I don't like to give much, much attention to Lucifer, but if we're going to study end times, we have, to, we have to have a foundation because he's a major player in the latter days. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 12, we see that Ezekiel, once again, he's seen two things here. He's seen something in the natural, and he's seen something off into the future because he's prophesying about this king of Tyre. And he says in verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So he starts off prophesying to this king of Tyre, and then he begins to prophesy about Lucifer, and he's, and he's explaining what happened to Lucifer. Lucifer was the seal of perfection. Lucifer was created by God, and the Bible says that he was very beautiful, beauty and splendor and brightness, perfect in physical form, flawless in symmetry. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, and the emerald with gold. So here we have this beautiful created being, uh, named Lucifer that was perfect in symmetry and he was covered with precious stones sardis and topaz all these beautiful stones covered him and look verse 13 goes on the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created so God not only created this beautiful creature and, and, and embedded precious stones all over his body and covered him in precious stones. He placed within him timbrels and pipes where whenever Lucifer would walk, music would permeate through the environment, through the atmosphere. He was also referred to as the anointed cherub. Verse 14, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. He, Lucifer was the anointed cherub who, who God had had made, there was only, no one was higher than Lucifer except God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Lucifer, the anointed cherub, um, would lead the angels to the holy temple. 
to the holy mountain. I established you, verse 14 says. You are on the holy mountain of God. Um, God established him. He had total access to the holy mountain of God. And he, he walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. There's, a, there's something deeper there that we're going to get into. Walking in the midst of, his fire, of the fiery stones was one of Satan's assignments, one of his, his jobs, one of his, one of his um, callings to do. This was a remarkable creature. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So imagine with me, if you will, that in eternity past, there is this holy mountain on the sides of the north, and at this holy mountain, there's this temple. And at this temple, this is where the created angels would come and they would worship God. And there was, a, there was the most anointed cherub, the, the, the one bedecked with jewels and, and, and music permeated forth from him. His name was Lucifer. And he would lead the, he, he would lead the angels there. I, and he, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And they would go to this holy temple, and, and, and Lucifer would lead worship. And he had everything. He had a destiny. He had a calling. He had giftings. He had favor with God. He had access to God. He was beautiful. He was perfect in every way. Yet iniquity was found in him. And when it was found in him, he had a fall, a great fall. Now turn back real quickly to verse 14. Remember the fiery stones? I told you about that. That, that was one of his jobs, to walk in the midst of the fiery stones. In verse 13, we see that he was covered with these stones. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. Now remember the rule of double reference. What was happen has happened in heaven also happens on the earth. Only the earth is a copy of what happens in heaven. Turn to Exodus chapter 28. Isn't that interesting? We're in Ezekiel 28. Now we're going to Exodus 28. God's in the numbers. Exodus 28. Now Exodus 28 is when they are instituted the priesthood and the whole chapter of Exodus 28 is about the garments for the priesthood. We don't have time to read the entire chapter but look at this because there's something really interesting here. When the high priest had his clothing made they, they talked about different things that that he would wear but one of the things that he wore was a breastplate and over the breastplate there were embedded into the breastplate stones, four rows of stones, three each. And in verse 17 it says, And you shall put settings of stones in it. Four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row a jacinth, an agite, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. Doesn't that sound familiar? Here we have Lucifer, who was embedded or had precious stones embedded into him. And then we have the high priest, who wore a breastplate that had these stones embedded into the, into the, into the breastplate. But there's something that's, that's unique here. With, with the high priest, we have four rows of three, which means there is 12 stones. Yet when we talk about Lucifer, we see that he had nine stones. So what happened? Well, remember when Lucifer, one of Lucifer's assignments was to walk through the fiery stones. And when he was walking through the fiery stones, he was accomplishing something. We'll get to that next week. But each time he walked through the fiery stones and accomplished a segment of his commission from God, God would give him another stone. 
and he so he is up to nine stones that Lucifer had had embedded into him. God had an incredible destiny for him. God had a, a call for him, but Lucifer, but iniquity was found in Lucifer, and his destiny was cut short. So what are the three missing stones? What do they represent? How did all that happen? And what's that have to do with the end times? I'm glad you asked. Because next week, or next time we meet, we're going, to, we're going to continue to put the pieces of this puzzle together. And we're going to see the fall of Lucifer. And, af and after he fell, what he has been doing since then. And how he has a part to play all the way through the end times into the very end. That's all for next week. In the meantime, keep reading your Bible. Pray and walk in love. God bless you. See you soon.